Um, hello, good evening, welcome to the seminar, um, The History of People, Place and Community, the Institute of Historical Research. Uh, my name is Adam Chapman and I am editor of Victoria County History um, and, uh, and one of the members of the CHPPC team here at IHR. Uh, if you're not muted, could I request that you are, that you do mute yourselves, please, um, because we are recording. If you don't wish to appear on, on the recorded version, um, please turn your camera off. If you'd like to ask questions, then you can do so in the chat as we go along, or um, in person in various ways, either online or in the room. We have something called an owl here, so people in the room who aren't want to ask a question will be automatically uh, focused upon. So if, that, if, it, if it seems slightly disconcerting to you, it's slightly disconcerting to us too, because you will appear on the screen behind us. So, um, that being in mind, so a bit more about the Centre. Um, the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community is um, fosters engaged innovative research into placed histories uh, across all regions and periods, periods from the rural and urban to the parish to the metropolis. Today we're looking more at the metropolis, with an emphasis on the localised, the micro historical, and the site specific. We're home to projects including my own, the Victoria County History, and digital crowdsourced mapping project Layers of London. And we work together with others to develop imaginative new approaches to making history and to identify opportunities for history to make a difference in the real world today. So for today's seminar, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Hansel. Um, and Peter has contributed to the VCH in a very, very small way. He says sometimes that's slightly less than a page. Yes, <laughs> probably isn't the shortest ever contribution no. to the VCH but it's probably in the bottom 5%. Um, um, Peter is going to be introducing us to uh, London's Brickfields, and there is a book accompanying this, uh, published by the University of Hertfordshire Press, which is called Bricks of Victoria and London, A Social and Economic History. Um, so if the time comes, we have two different modes for asking questions, which I've already mentioned. Um, we have the chat facility on uh, Zoom, for those of you outside the room, and obviously in the room, you just raise your hand. So we actually have three options. Um, or you can appear on camera via the raise hand function on Zoom. Um, if you uh, if you are on social media or on Twitter, you can tweet along with the seminar at, to, but please include our, our handle, which is at chppc underscore IHR, if that's your thing. Um, so this is the last seminar before Christmas. So um, before we start, happy Christmas. Seems we do. Uh, and I'll now, without further ado, hand you over to Peter. And let's just get the side shot. Uh, oh. Peter. Thank you, Adam. As Adam's saying, I recently published this book, Bricks of Victoria in London, and this is the, the third talk I've given in the last 10 weeks, I think. Um, and each one has been tailored in a sense to a particular audience. And tonight I'm very conscious that, um, that the, the remit of this seminar. So I'm gonna focus very much on places and to some extent on communities of people associated with places to do with brick making. So I want to talk about the places where bricks are made and the communities that grew up around them and try and answer questions such as this. What characterise the sites in, around, in and around London that supply bricks to the capital? Were they distinctive? And if so, how? And what impact did they have on the townscape or rural landscape in which they were set? So before we answer those questions, we need to consider what processes are involved in brick making in the 19th century. Brick making is a relatively simple process. In short, you take some clay, shape it into a rectangular mold, and then fire it until it's hard. But there are, of course, a number of variations around that basic approach. The particular method of manufacture in the London area had been established um, in the extensive rebuilding that took place in the wake of the Great Fire of 1666. And it had changed little, those processes, during the subsequent century. So if we were, a, if we were an entrepreneur considering making bricks for a living, where would we establish our manufacturing site? Now the theory of industrial location um, produced by Alfred Weber in 1909 suggests that most 
processes, the ideal site for your plant will be either near to the market you intended to serve or near to the source of the main raw materials. The intention would be to minimize the cost of transportation generally charged on weight rather than on the value of the goods. And bricks are essentially a high weight, low value product. If the product loses weight during the course of its manufacture, then it makes sense to site your plant as near as possible to the source of your raw materials. And brick manufacture falls into that category. A brick weighs much more when it's been freshly molded than it does after it's been fired. In the style of manufacture prevalent in the London area, clay and two other raw materials were required, those two materials being chalk and ashes, together with a smaller quantity of sand. Clay was the most important of these, obviously, but it made, so it made sense to locate brick manufacture as near to the source of the clay as possible and to bring the chalk, ashes and sand to the site from elsewhere. In some parts of the home counties, particularly in northern Kent, chalk was found conveniently close to brick clay, but this wasn't the case everywhere. If you could find suitable clay close to the place where the bricks were going to be used, you had the optimal economic conditions for your business. London, to quote from modern Pevsners, is lamentably short of good quality building stone, Rygate and Kentish Ragstone being the most accessible uh, to London, but not necessarily the best. This didn't stop architects, of course, using stone for more prestigious buildings, and many London landmarks, of course, are faced with Portland stone. For the new Houses of Parliament in the 1840s, stone was sourced from a quarry in Yorkshire, but only after extensive research and quarry visits, whilst the bricks came from a brick field in Heston. What London lacks in terms of stone, of course, it makes up with the abundance of clay suitable for making bricks. Clays of differing kinds are found widely in London and in the counties surrounding it. And brick makers were aware of what kinds of earth could be used to make a satisfactory brick. In the 19th century, that material was almost always referred to as brick earth, although it varied in composition from place to place. Now, brick earth has been defined by Ian Smalley in these terms. Brick earth is an ancient term and is still widely used. It is also the cause of much confusion and imprecision in the scientific study of the lowest deposits and brick making materials in Britain. The term was extensively used when the geological survey was mapping Southeast England at the end of the 19th century. It referred to a loamy surficial and near surficial deposit often found in river valleys. It was not a precise scientific term, but at the time it was an adequate mapping one. In 1856, R. W. Milne published his map of the geology and contours of London and its environs, and he plotted many areas of brick earth. So this is a portion of the map showing the area north of the bend in the River Thames at Chiswick and Hammersmith. And the brick earth is the area coloured in pink. So we're not talking about the familiar heavy London clay, but a lighter material that is easier to work and one that was possible to mould by hand. It was widely distributed as this map uh, shows. I'm not saying these are the only places where you found brick earth, but these are places where brick earth is found in association where bricks were being made. Moreover, it was also found outside the boundaries of what we now call Greater London, along the Thames estuary in South Essex towards South End, and in North Kent along the Medway and the Swale. Now, given the presence of brick earth, widespread presence of brick earth, it was often possible to manufacture bricks close to the place where they were used. On the domestic scale, a builder could establish his brick field near to the houses he was building, and in some cases to make the bricks from the clay he dug out to create the cellars of his new homes. This process was documented by Linda Clark for the Brill Estate in Somerstown at the end of the 18th century. But this practice comes into its own with the big infrastructure projects of the 19th century, particularly the building of tunnels and viaducts 
for the new railways. For example, the Great Northern Railway's route into King's Cross required the excavation of the Copenhagen Tunnel by the contractors Pierce and Smith, who set up a brickfield nearby. And the excavated earth was used to make the bricks that line the tunnel. Similarly, during the construction of the Penge Tunnel under Sydenham Hill for the London, Chatham and Dover Railway in the early 1860s, a brickfield of 16 acres at the Penge end and 10 acres at the Dulwich end supplied the 33 million bricks with which it's lined. For much of the 19th century, the places where bricks were made were generally referred to as brickfields, spelt as one word, a hyphenated word, or as two words. And you see these on Alden survey maps. The legend brickfield appears regularly as these examples suggest. There is, however, little detail on the maps where you see brickfields to show what the manufacturing process was like. This is largely because brickfields of this period had few, if any, buildings. So there were no permanent structures for the cartographers to record. Brickfields, as the name suggests, were literally fields on which bricks were made. Now, a brickfield fulfilled two functions, as a place where the brick earth or similar clays are to be found, and the place where the bricks used using that clay were made. For the process to be as efficient as possible, the area that's being dug for clay should be as close to the area where the bricks are being molded, dried and fired. Brick making in the London area operated on a seasonal pattern. The clay was dug in the autumn, piled up and allowed to weather during the winter, using the effects of rain and frost to break down the clay. In the spring and summer, usually from April to September, the main making season occurred. The bricks were molded by hand in the open air at a bench with some sort of awning to, get, to keep the sun off the molder, if not to protect him from the rain. If it rained heavily, brick making stopped because the bricks got damaged by the rain. This is a rather picturesque view, as you can see. Um, uh, the reality, I'm sure, was less glamorous. Moulding, as this image possibly suggests, moulding gangs were usually comprised of six people, men, women and children, often drawn from the same nuclear or extended family. The leader of the gang, the moulder himself, subcontracted with the owner of the brickfield to make the bricks at a piece rate. These moulding teams could make between 750,000 and a million bricks in the course of the season. The weather clay was mixed in what was known as a pug mill and carried to the molding bench where the molder made the bricks. These were then loaded onto the barrow, which you can see in the picture, taken to an area known as the hacks, where they were stacked to dry. Once dried, they were taken to a kiln or built into a clamp to be fired. And a clamp was widely used in London, but it's essentially a kiln made of the bricks themselves. And here's an image of some brick make, uh, some setters, as they were known, um, building a clamp. So the bricks were built into a structure, leaving air holes between the layers to allow the hot gases from the fire lit at the base to permeate through it. Clamp fired bricks took longer to be burnt than kiln fired ones, but the practice was widely adopted in the London area. And of course, clamps required less investment on the part of the owner. The fuel used was cinders extracted from London's domestic rubbish mixed with a small amount of kindling and coal to get the fire started. And this method of manufacture required few if any permanent buildings on a brick field. There may have been a wooden hut on the site for the foreman or a clerk. Brickfields also had things called sand houses which were from descriptions, I've never seen a picture of one from descriptions, were wood or brick sheds in which to store the sand and to prevent it getting wet. One of the more permanent features on a brick field was a clay or chalk mill, a circular brick line pit in which material was ground to the right consistency for mixing with the other ingredients. So this is from a handbook of the, uh, uh, from the 1850s, uh, very much quoted often by people who are interested in um, brick making of this period. 
And I've shown you a close up of the one of the maps I just showed you earlier, which actually you can hopefully can see a clay mill identified. A horse powered the mill, as the illustration suggests, but once steam or petrol engines became more common on brickfields, clay mills and pug mills would have been belt driven. Clay mills are one of the few features that are labeled on ordnance survey maps. With the introduction of machinery, however, some brickfields had more obvious buildings. And then the term brickworks began to appear rather than brickfield. So you can see here, this is a brickfield in Southall. And you can see the, there's a brickfield there with its own siding onto what's the great, what is in fact the Great Western main line between Paddington and Bristol. Now brickfields like this could exist either within a townscape or within an otherwise agricultural landscape. At the beginning of the 19th century, Henry Hunter observed the extent of brick making in places like Hackney and Islington and made a general observ observ generalized observation about a zone of brick making, which he identified on the edge of the built up area in this part of London. So this is what he wrote. Immediately contiguous to the town, the face of the land is deformed by the multitude of clay pits whence are dug the brick earth used in the kilns which smoke all around London, to the great annoyance of the neighbouring inhabitants, though probably more to the benefit than injury of their health. The brick earth is reckoned upon an average to run four feet in depth and to yield one million of bricks per acre in each foot. The land is levelled after all the brick earth is taken from it, and by the help of rubbish and manure is raised in its surface, though it still remains lower than the adjoining roads. The old brick grounds converted into pasture, together with a quantity of unbroken pasture land, form a green and open tract around London, especially to the north of it, which is almost solely in the possession of cow keepers who supply the metropolis with milk. So this picture, I hope, um, gives, you, gives you a sense of the kind of environment that brickmaking created. So this is an engraving in an area of Chelsea in the 1830s, and we're looking, as you can see, towards Westminster Abbey. Now, the clay pit is in the foreground with some sort of winding gear, which is some sort of mill, presumably, um, on the top. And the hacks, you probably can't see them on this, at this scale, but if I show you a close up, you can see the hacks are laid out in the middle there, in the middle ground. So these long rows of bricks, they're th three or four bricks high, a bit higher, and they're just laid out in, in, to dry. And you see people with barrows carrying stuff around. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a busy and rather unattractive in a way environment. In 1800, Thomas Milne published a land utilization map of London and its environs, and he identified 12 different types of land use. So this is an excerpt from his map, um, showing again a part of Chiswick. Each field was marked with a letter and color coded. The scale of Milne's maps allow few clay pits to, be, to appear, but some unfilled ones were visible in Mile End and Southwark. Now the geographer GBG Ball took Hunter's description and combined it with Thomas Milne's map and produced a composite plan of land use in the London area as shown here. So you'll see, I think, hopefully you can see an area described as pits. So you've got the built over area, and then you've got an area described as pits on the edge. Because of the size of Ball's map, it's perhaps difficult to perfectly position Hunter's clay pit zone, but I think that we might expect it to be in the parishes on the north side of the new road that east-west toll road built across the open fields in the 1750s. Though designed as a means of bypassing the built-up area of London, it remained the boundary between the urban and rural for some time. In the, in the decades after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the area north of it would see extensive housing development with a consequent need for bricks and brickfields. 
At the western end, John Nash was developing Regent's Park, and on an 1804 map of the neighboring parish of St Pancras, eight, eight brick fields are identifiable. So you can see one of them, you can see um, three of them on that particular portion of the map. Further east, Hunter had noted of Islington that, quote, many bricks are made in the part adjoining to Hackney Parish, end of quote, and of Hackney itself that, quote, large quantities of bricks are made, particularly around Kingsland, end of quote. And it's in these areas that the majority of brickmakers listed in the commercial directories of the 1820s are to be found. This lovely picture is um, used in the cover of the book. Um, and it shows a brick field in, on, the, on the Kingsland Road uh, in Hackney. It's the interesting element of this, of course, is it shows brick making in, prog in progress on the left-hand side of the image, but also illustrates another feature common to brick fields, um, the growing of crops on them a subject um, to which I will return. So it's, it's, we, have, we had a deliberation with somebody about what crops these were. I think they're probably, they look to me like something like potatoes, I think, but other people have different. Somebody suggested it was watercress, but I really don't think it was. In Hunter's view, the worked out brick fields were being restored and returned to cultivation as, as you heard. But as the edge of the built up area moved northwards, brick fields were like to be built over and become absorbed into the townscape. And as you know, the growth of London didn't follow a, a regular ripple effect from the center, as it depended among other things on the way that landowners chose to use their land. This left pockets of undeveloped land within the townscape. And these in turn, if the soil yielded a suitable clay, might well become brickfields. An example of this is a brickfield on the Stonefields estate in Islington, the subject to another rather lovely watercolour. As you can see, this is a small scale affair with only one moulding bench visible and little sign, quite honestly, about any activity. In the background are the buildings, I think, of Barnsbury Street, including the distinctive bulk of the Islington workhouse. Within a few years, this site was built over, presumably with the bricks produced on the field. Brickmakers of this period included the Rhodes family in Hackney and Islington, who started out as cowkeepers on the Metropolitan Fringe, then becoming estate developers, and Thomas Cubitt, who made bricks in connection with many of his housing developments and had a brick field in the Caledonian Road. Now, whilst in operation, brick fields like these provided a liminal space within the urban environment. Reports of different kinds of activity occurring on them suggest they were not adequately fenced and could easily be invaded. During daylight hours in the moulding season, they would be busy, but at night and in the winter months, they would be largely deserted. They therefore proved attractive to the homeless, as well as those in great, engaged in various kinds of criminality, especially as the burning clamps provided a source of warmth on a chilly night. Deaths took place and reports of coroner's inquests appeared in the newspapers. Because sadly, falling asleep on or beside a burning clamp was hazardous and could result in death from asphyxiation, if not from burning. So here is an example of one of these reports. On Saturday, Mr. Baker held an inquest at the Bull, Haggerston Road, on the body of William Butler, aged 18. James Morsey, clerk to Mr. Rhodes, brickmaker, said he was walking across the fields at six o'clock that morning when he saw the deceased lying apparently asleep upon a pile of bricks, then in process of burning. The witness, knowing the deadly nature of the vapor, ran immediately to remove him, but found him quite dead. Upon examining, he found his right arm and shoulder severely burnt. He thought the deceased had lain on the bricks the previous night on account of their warmth, and that he'd been overcome by the fumes. Mr. Pickering, surgeon, said the death had been caused by suffocation, and the verdict was accidental death. Two years earlier, 
three wretched looking poles, as they were described, were found camped out on Cubitt's Brickfield in Chelsea. In another case, four boys who had absconded from a workhouse died on another of Mr. Rhodes Brickfields on Maiden Lane, St. Pancras, again from asphyxiation. And as well as offering warmth to those living rough, it was a place of concealment for those undertaking criminal activities or just for those just wanting to avoid the authorities. In 1856, two boys constructed a cave for themselves on another Hackney Brickfield, and from this hiding place raided local orchards and hen coops for food. <laughs> Their activities were modest compared to those of a gang who from a base on a Brickfield in Bethnal Green, terrorized the neighborhood for several weeks in the summer of 1826, stealing from local shops, robbing residents, and apparently rustling cattle that were being driven to Smithfield Market. They used the heat from the clamps to cook their stolen provisions. It took an appeal to Home Secretary Peel and his intervention to bring the situation under control. None of the reports suggest what was happening on the brick, to the brick making activities going on while this was <laughs> completely not, not, not reported at all. Brickfields provided play areas for children who went to play, but there were hazards from abandoned clay pits, which often flooded. As you can imagine, on hot summer days, they attracted groups of children building rafts and the like, and perhaps not surprisingly, some of them drowned. People also cross brickfields as shortcuts from one place to another, but this could be dangerous, particularly for women at night, as they put themselves at risk of being followed and sadly sexually assaulted. Brickfields were not always welcome within, within an urban environment for other reasons. Well, this is a, a, a not easy to identify. This is, is it, 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 it said, or there's a, written on the bottom of this engraving, which I purchased, it says Brickfield in Sloan Street, Chelsea. I can't imagine exactly where that is. But, I mean, I can't imagine how that fits into Sloan Street, but certainly not the Sloan Street we know now. A major complaint was always about the smoke created when the bricks were being burnt. You can see the smoking clamp in the background of this engraving. But there were also objections to the way that heavy brick carts damaged the surface of local roads and the ugliness of the brick fields themselves. As early as the early 18th century, Defoe had complained that Brick Lane was already a deep, dirty road on account of the passage of brick carts along it. And there were complaints about the way that in an attempt to avoid the tolls charged on turnpike roads, carters were encouraged to take to side roads, which they then damaged. Complaints about the smoke from brickfields increased throughout the 19th century. With the enactment of anti-nuisance legislation from the 1840s onwards, local vestries acquired powers to act when residents raised concerns, and medical officers could investigate and rule on the alleged health impacts. The use of clamps rather than kilns was at the heart of the problem. Clamp burning was likely to produce more smoke than a kiln, and the problem was compounded by the type of fuel used the partially burnt coal and cinders recovered from domestic rubbish. At, for much of the 19th century, the residue from domestic fires accounted for around 80% of the contents of the dustbins emptied by the London vestries and their contractors. This domestic rubbish had to be disposed of and brickmakers helped subsidize the cost of removal by paying for the ashes and breeze. And the finer material was added to the clay mix, which is why you get all those cinder pop, uh, pop marks on um, the yellow stock bricks. Uh, the coarser material was used as fuel and brickmakers acquired what they needed in either a sifted or an unsifted state. In the case of the latter, which was smelly from the putrescible matter it contained, the sifting would then take place on the brick field. In either case, the sieve fuel was still light to be contaminated to some extent with rotting material, which gave off unpleasant smells when burnt. In 1863, the General Board of Health instructed the Enfield Local Board that it could treat brick burning as an offensive manufacturer within the terms of the 1848 Public Health Act. In 1885, Hampstead Vestry took action against the local brickmaker who was told to cease burning bricks because of the, quote, sickening and disagreeable emanations, end of quote, 
that his activities were producing. Following complaints in the Bedford Park area of Chiswick in 1890, it was predicted that, quote, the outcry against clamp burning on brickfields near London suburbs will probably drive the trade eventually into more rural spots or compel an alteration in the method of manufacture, end of quote. The difficulties of suppressing clamp burning in urban areas was compounded by the fact that the smoke produced didn't observe local authority boundaries. So complaints referred to Kensington Vestry, for example, arose from brickfields in neighbouring Hammersmith, whose smoke was driven their way by the prevailing southwesterly winds. Brickfields adjacent to the built-up area of London would eventually be built over, a process to which, of course, they contributed. The clay pit zone would then move to areas further from the centre, in places like Edmonton, to the north of London. However, as we noted earlier, the outward growth of London was irregular. So even in the end of the 19th century, there was a busy brick-making area in East Acton and Hammersmith on land owned by the ecclesiastical commissioners, even though more westerly places like Ealing were already becoming suburbanised. And in 1908, the Franco-British Exhibition um, was built on what had been brickfields, which in turn led to the creation, as we know, of the neighbourhood we know as White City. Excuse me a moment. By the mid 19th century, brick fields near the centre of London were unable to provide the quantity of bricks required for house building and infrastructure projects. For example, Basil Jett's drainage scheme for the Metropolitan Board of Works required 318 million bricks within the course of a few years. As a result, much of the brick making industry supplying the London market moved much further out from the centre, but remained economically viable because of the availability of good water transport. The cheapest way was always by water, either along the Thames or on local canals, particularly along the Grand Junction Canal. The Thames was already being used in the early years of the 19th century to move bricks from one part of London to another. For example, for the construction of the West India Dock in the first decade of the century. Here on the West India Dock, it had been planned originally to um, make the bricks on site. Uh, but the, but the clay was found not to be suitable, so other supplies had to be found. One of the brickmakers able to meet the demand was James Trimmer from his brickfield near Kew Bridge. The Thames would also be vital to the development of brickfields to the east of the city, at places like Grays in Essex on the North Bank and Crayford on the Kent side. Eventually, the pull of the London market would lead to the development of what would be the biggest area supplying it with bricks. That is that the one the one in North Kent, around the Swale, which you can see hopefully, and along the Medway. A smaller but in, in, smaller but important centre also grew up along the Thames Estuary in South Essex, in places as you can see marked on the map of Benfleet, Shubriness, and Great Wakering. Now bricks were transported along the river in spritsail barges, whose sails and masts could be lowered to work under bridges. Barges of this kind were originally used to transport hay and ag other agricultural goods from Kent and could be easily adapted to carry bricks. And the major brick makers in places like Sittingbourne in Kent became large scale barge operators. Eastwards, with brick making plants both east and west of London, were one such. Their return cargoes were often the ashes and breeze collected at the vestry dust wharfs. On the west side of London, another major brick-making district developed in West Middlesex and Buckinghamshire following the construction of the Grand Junction Canal in the 1790s. Designed to shorten the journey from the Midlands to London, the route of the canal took it across Middlesex from Uxbridge to Brentford, where it joined the Thames. Within a few years, it was decided to create a quicker route into central London than via the Thames, uh, by the Thames and so a branch was promoted to Paddington, where a basin was created with keys for loading and unloading goods. With the construction of the Regents Canal in 1820, traffic could pass from the Grand Junction onto the Regents and deliver to wharves in places like Camden, King's Cross, Islington and Hackney. 
So this is the brick fields that grew up along the Grand Junction Canal or the places where brick making grew up. Digging out the bed of the canal may have been the way in which the brick making potential of this area of Middlesex was recognized. As soon as the canal was completed, brick fields opened up on both banks at places like West Drayton, Usley, Hayes, Hollington, South or Heston, Yedding and Northolt. The area became known at the time as the Cowley district from the small village just south of Uxbridge. Traditional canal boats were used to move bricks from this area into London. As the canal was built to a generous width, it was possible to employ wide boats as well as narrow boats in this trade. This is one of the few pictures I've found of a narrow boat, uh, of a canal boat carrying bricks. Landowners in these more rural areas had to decide whether to allow their lands to be used for brick making or not. At a distance from the center of London, there was not an immediate prospect that their land would be built over. So they contemplated the prospect that eventually, when the brick earth had been exhausted after say 20 or 10 or 20 years, the land would revert to agricultural use. In the meantime, brick making enabled the landowner to get an increased income, but at the expense that the land would be partially degraded. Covenants were included in leases obliging tenants to work the site in ways that protected the land as far as possible. So including, for example, removing and preserving the topsoil for later replacement, protecting water courses and avoiding flooding, and also working it in a systematic manner. A landlord would charge his brickmaking tenant a rent, which would be in line with the rent he would charge a tenant farmer but in addition, levy a royalty on the number of bricks made. The income from royalties fluctuated from year to year, but tenancies always stipulated the minimum number of bricks to be made, and consequently the minimum income the landlord expected to receive. So this is a more generalized view of what one of these rural brick fields might have, might have looked like. This is reputedly to be a picture of a brick field near Edmonton. But it's a, this, this is a strange picture. It exists in three different versions, at least. Um, this one's in the Science Museum, uh, with all slightly different detail, but principally the same image. But it, it's thought to be, I say, of Edmonton. I say, in these more rural areas, brick making fitted into an existing agricultural landscape, as say, as this painting suggests. Leases of brickmakers were often for periods of 14 or 21 years and were for acreage in, in excess of what was immediately required for clay digging. At the extreme end of the scale, the gentleman brickmaker Samuel Pocock took on a lease of 100 acres of land in West Drayton for a term of 40 years. As in any given year, brickmaking occupied only a small proportion of the land the tenant held so it was in his, and occasionally I have to say her interest, therefore to use the rest of the land in a productive manner by taking crops from it or letting it out for grazing. So for example, in 1851, brickmakers Heron and Rutter held auction sales of wheat from their brickfield at Usley and 64 acres of corn, oats and barley from their fields at Heston and Hayes. Plans of brickfields are rare. So this one of a brick field in Harlington is helpful in understanding how a brick field operated. I'm going to leave that to you to look at it a second, and I'm going to show you uh, my redrawing of it, which may hopefully make some of it a little clearer. You can see some buildings associated with brick making, together with some cottages for the workforce. There are docks on the canal for loading and unloading. But you'll also see the areas marked as agricultural land and an orchard. We can't tell from the plan where the agricultural land had already been dug for brick earth or its land that's uh, ready to be used later on. In rural areas, it was common for the owners or tenants of the brick fields to provide accommodation for their employees. These communities of brick field cottages tended to be at a distance from existing village centres and close to the brick fields themselves, actually on the brick fields themselves. Um, many of you might be familiar with Dickens, um, who described one such community in the South Albans area of Hertfordshire in Bleak House, 
but it's unclear whether he drew this from life or from merely from his imagination. As he described it, uh, the brickmaker's house was one of a cluster of wretched hovels in a brickfield with br pigsties close to the broken windows and miserable little gardens before the doors growing nothing but stagnant pools. He didn't draw, the, 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 there was an illustration of the exterior of the house, but there is one of the interior as, mm -hmm. as depicted by Fizz. Um, and you can see the drunken brickmaker um, who says I'll be as drunk as I want for as long as I want, I don't care much. Um, and he's being visited by Mrs. Pardigal and with her uh, charitable um, intentions. More surprisingly, perhaps, the novelist Anthony Trollope provides a very good description of a brick field and its workings in his fictional Barsetshire. Though it isn't clear, as far as I know, on what he based his description. But he, he emphasized the separation between the brickmakers and the residents of the nearby villages and refers to the home of the brickmakers as a colony. It's worth quoting this at length. Here it is. And on the brink of this canal, there had sprung up a colony of brickmakers, the nature of the earth in those parts combining with the canal to make brickmaking a suitable trade. The workmen there assembled were not, for the most part, native born. They had come hither, thither from unknown regions as laborers of that class do come when they are needed. Some young men from, from that and neighboring parishes had joined themselves to the colony, allured by wages and disregarding the menaces of the neighboring farmers. But they were all in appearance and manners nearer akin to the race of navvies than to ordinary rural laborers. They had a bad name in the country, but it may be that their name was worse than their deserts. The farmers hated them and consequently they hated the farmers. They had a beer shop and a grocer's shop and a huckster's shop for their own accommodation and were consequently vilified by the small old established tradesmen around them. Brickmakers' cottages, we may suppose, varied in quality, but unlike the accommodation provided for navvies building canals or railways, they were more likely to be better than mere, mere huts. As the owner's business was making bricks, they were likely to be brick built. However, they were generally small and cramped. R.M. Smythe, a Southall brickmaker, referred to his older properties that he owned as three-roomed huts, whereas he claimed the newer ones were comfortable cottages, a distinction reflected in the higher rent he charged for them. There are some pictures to survive of these brickfield cottages. But the, however well built they were, brickfield cottages would have been cramped given the size of many families in the Victorian period, and you can check that from the census, and consist of only two or three rooms. The tenants of these cottages would be those brickmakers who had year-round employment, such as the moulders. With the custom of taking on additional people for the moulding season, there was an expect expectation placed on gang leaders to provide accommodation for them in their own homes. These extra hands were most likely unmarried young men, and their presence would have added to the reputation the brickmakers had for drunkenness, improvidence and irreligion. They would also have proved a threat, real or imagined, to the young women of the families with whom they lodged, given the intimacy inevitable in these cramped conditions. The wife of one brickmaker complained that the boarders she encountered were, quote, a filthy, drunken, lousy lot, and that's the truth, the most of them. At all events, those that don't live in the neighbourhood, but just come down for the summer work and then go off and are never seen again, end of quote. So many brickmaking businesses acquired or built rows of cottages for their workmen. The Southall Brickmaking Company, which employed as many as 150 people in the, in the 1860s, owned 32. And rows of cottages were often identified by the names of the business, such as Stroud Row or Rigby's Row. In Heston in 1869, there were 21 cottages owned by Daniel Rutter, 23 by Tildesley and Minter, 15 by Thomas Hiscock, and eight by James Burchett. Not all of these are in identifiable on contemporary maps, but Rigby's Row is clearly marked on this one. You can see it at the top left-hand corner of the picture, and in the and in the expanded bit in the other on the right-hand side. 
The largest brickmaker of all in the counties around London was the firm of Smead Dean in Sittingbourne. By the 1920s, this company had built up an estate of 303 cottages together with a shop and post office. This is what they look like. These were brick built terraces of two stories, but newspaper reports suggest that earlier housing he provided for his workers had been more primitive without inside cooking facilities. In one case, a group of brickfield homes formed the basis of a new settlement altogether. The village of Eccles near Aylesford in Kent was largely built to house the workers of Thomas Cubitt, some of whom had relocated from his now closed brickfield in the Caledonian Road to his new brickfield at Burham. It started with the building of 22 cottages in the 1860s. Brickfield workers were widely resented on account of their unruly behaviour, particularly their drinking. So there was likely to be a distance between the incoming brickmakers and the more permanent residents in nearby villages. But I, don't, I think we, should, we shouldn't make too much of this, since although brickmakers moved around from one district to another in search of work, many brickmakers worked in the areas from which they originally came and had chosen brickmaking instead of agricultural work or some other occupation. As Trollope had described, alongside these groups of cottages, there was often a public house or beer shop, sometimes operated by the owner of the brickfield. Brickmakers drank prodigiously during the course of their working day. Six to eight pints was reckoned to be the amount. And it made sense, therefore, the supply of the beer was close to the brickfield. There was probably no source of potable water on the brickfield, and nor probably any sanitary facilities of any kind. And this is a public house owned by the Smead Dean Company in Merston near Sittingbourne. Public houses were the one communal building in the area. The men might be paid there on a Saturday evening, a situation, as you can imagine, never to be open to abuse. Publicans might also supply groceries and other foodstuff to the workers' families, especially since they were not always, they did not always have easy access to village shops. This, of course, prompted occasional complaints that the licenses were con contravening the track acts. Not surprisingly, the Brickies' behaviour drew the attention of temperance reformers and Christian missionaries, who were determined to wean them off their excessive consumption of alcohol as the first step in a, pro in a, in a programme of improvement. Providing an alternative to the public house in which the Brickies could spend their leisure time was part of the strategy, and in several places mission halls were established with reading rooms. The missionary in Southall was outspoken in his defence of the Brickies, and complained about the local newspaper that kept reporting their misdeeds. So we set up a reading room for them, but one over which they would have control, recognising that to be successful, that this needed, they needed to have an agency in what was provided. The local brickfield owner, the same Samuel Tildersley, who we've just encountered, provided the building and the gas lighting to light it. Sadly, we don't know what the building looked like, and nor do we know really how long it remained in existence. Schooling was another issue that caused friction between the brickmakers and the other residents. When children had been used to working, the brickfields arrived in local schools, they were thought to be a disruptive influence on account of their erratic attendance and rough manners. A Heston schoolmaster claimed that, quote, their habitual swearing is the cause of the tradesmen children not attending school, end of quote. In some districts, attempts were made to set up schools close to the brickfields to encourage the British children to attend. In 1858, the Vicar of Hayes appealed via the Times newspaper for charitable donations for a school he wished to start, having already received pledges from one local brickmaker, Henry Dodd, and others. Now, these communities of brickfield workers with their own beer shop, mission hall, and schoolroom grew up beside the brickfields, but it's difficult to know how long they lasted or how well the facilities were used. This one at West Drayton in Middlesex got survived into the 1820s. So I hope you can see on this map, um, you've got the part, you've got the railway, you've got the, this is the Great Western Railway running across the top of the map. And you'll see below it, you see the Dawley Arms, and then hopefully you see the school, and then you'll see a mission hall. Um, Eventually, the brickfields they served were exhausted their clay and the land reverted to agriculture. 
The cottages, however, often survive much longer than their expected lifespan to a point where they cease to meet newer sanitary standards and were condemned and sorry and condemned and demolished. Wooden row. Oh, sorry, I, I expanded that picture for you to see slightly better where they. The other thing you might be interested to know is this, this strange feature that's looping, that's looping down here is actually a dock from the canal. Um, and this particular one is interesting because the canal is on the other side of the railway. So the dock connects to the canal right in the corner of the image, just right, just off the edge, and then goes under the railway and then loops round. This, this, is, this is Wooden Row. Wooden Row is a group of cottages built between the Great Western Railway and the Grand Junction Canal in West Drayton. And these were finally condemned on account of the lack of drainage facilities and water supplies in the mid 1930s. It's also suggested, I think, they, when they talk about this, that the ground had been lowered so much they couldn't get the drains low enough <laughs> to work with the rest of the drainage system in the area. So, to conclude, what can we say about the lasting impact of brickmaking on the landscape? Whereas in the early part of the 19th century, worked out brickfields were built over and absorbed into the built up area, old brickfields in more rural areas, especially those that would not experience large scale suburbanization perhaps until the interwar period, reverted to some form of agricultural use. Many brickfields remained as open spaces. Victoria Park in Hackney, opened in 1848, is built in part on an old brickfield. But perhaps we can illustrate this with. Um, the brickmaking area in the Northolt Yedding area in the modern boroughs of Ealing and Hillingdon. Um, so this this is eighteen sixties map. You can see the you can see the village of Yedding. It's a very small settlement. Um, you're on the and what's going down the image here is this is the Paddington arm of the Grand Junction Canal. And you can see a whole series, and you can see the disruptions of the land caused by this brickworking, brickmaking. And you can also see, which we also saw just, just now in, the, in Stockley, these long um, docks here and here and up here, coming off the, off the canal. Now, the brickfields on this stretch of the Paddington Arm um, span the boundary between, say, the parishes of Hayes and Northolt and will work for several decades. The part of Illing Hillingdon was owned by the Minette family, and the old brickfields form part of the, what's now the 36-acre Minette Country Park, and the dock where once the bricks were loaded is now a marina. So if I just show you this, I'm not sure how clear this is, but to show you this uh, Google um, satellite image, um, you will see Canals coming down here. The Minette Country Park is here. And you'll see this here is the marina. On the more northerly North Isle Park, brickmaking continued in a much more mechanized way until the Second World War. Eventually, it was built over to create what's now the Grand Union Village, which is up here. Nearby, however, a group of brickmakers' cottages put up by one of the companies that worked the site in the early 20th century still stands. So these, I mean, they obviously didn't look like it originally, but the one on the end is closer to what they would have, um, one here is probably closer to what they would have originally looked like. These are called Invictor cottages after the name of a patented brickmaking machine. As we've seen, the production methods used in many 19th century brickfields tended to leave little in the way of industrial archaeology of the cut uh, uh, that we might expect with other industries. It's only where the larger, more mechanized brickfields stood, like cubits at Burham, the remains of buildings can still be discovered in the undergrowth. As Hunter had identified 200 years ago, 
A telltale sign that a piece of land was once a brickfield could be that the surface of the ground is lower than that of its neighbours, or, or it's lower than a road that runs beside it. In the Medway Valley, there is land that is six feet below the road level, and similar effects, not necessarily as deep as that, are to be seen elsewhere. And I'm sure many of you will have discovered those for yourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs>